Hey guys, Gareth here, FCP here. Welcome back to another video. Uh, not a DIY today, something a little bit different. We're gonna be doing a teardown of this N55 core that is next to me. Uh, you can kind of see that it's clearly missing a lot of parts on it, uh, but that's because again, it is a core. Uh, this is not a rebuildable or usable core. We already know that uh, the engine has seized, so potentially that is going to be from a rod bearing having spun. I'm gonna go ahead and take a guess, it's towards the rear of the engine. Uh, we're gonna talk about why that could happen on one of these engines. We've talked a lot of really good stuff about the N55 and how it was a really good replacement for the N54 in terms of reliability, but that doesn't mean that this engine is completely bulletproof. There are certain circumstances which could cause it to spin a rod bearing, and we will talk about that when we get to that point. But with that said, let's go ahead and get right into the teardown, and uh, we'll show you everything that makes up this engine. So, we're gonna start at the top of the engine, work our way towards the bottom. Uh, intake manifold removal, we're gonna start here. Uh, again, this engine is a core. It's already sort of partially been disassembled, so like the intake manifold, which is normally held on with 11 millimeter nuts. Not really held on with anything right now, except a couple of studs. So here's the intake manifold. Uh, normally here, this is where the DME is physically bolted to. It's sealed with this gasket, so it's actually air-cooled. That's a unique feature on the N55 that wasn't on the other N52 or N54 engines. So if the intake manifold is off and um, you're doing any kind of work underneath, my suggestion would be to remove the DME, replace this gasket at the same time. And then obviously you have the gaskets that sit here in the intake manifold that's sealed to the cylinder head. So put this over here. Normally you have to remove 11 millimeter nuts, but not today. All right, so from here, a um, couple things to point out. Oil filter housing, it's not really secured. Normally it has three e-torx bolts that hold it in place. It's just held with one screw that's not even the right one. Uh, but I wanna show you the vacuum pump and the high pressure fuel pump drive mechanism. So right here's the vacuum pump. This is where the high pressure fuel pump would physically bolt to. This is later N55 that uses the tappet style high pressure fuel pump instead of the rotary style. Another thing a lot of people don't know is it has a position sensor on the side here. So the DME is using information from this as to where the, um, where the mechanism is for the high pressure fuel pump. This cam sensor or position sensor is the exact same thing as the intake and exhaust cam position sensor that I bolted up here. So again, this mechanism physically bolted the vacuum pump. Our high pressure fuel pump mounts on top. Obviously you have a low pressure feed line that comes through here. And um, the way that you remove all of this is this cap right here, which we'll remove later. Basically just remove this cap and then you can unbolt it and pull the whole thing out if you ever needed to do that. But these vacuum pumps are generally pretty robust. This engine had over 100,000 miles on it. I don't think it's ever been walnut blasted. So actually not that dirty. Do see a little bit of carbon uh, at the top of the valve stems, but overall actually pretty clean for all considered. That's number five. Number four. Uh, number three has got a little bit more in there. Number two, it's definitely a little wetter. And uh, number one, also worth mentioning here, uh, the PCV, there's actually ports inside these intake tracks up here at the top. It's like a little cut. Let's see if I can find it. There's a literally an opening in the backside of the port, and that's where the crankcase ventilation is on, on these engines. This will be the easiest injector removal you ever have on one of these engines. Most notably, you'll see this big opening here. That's not how these would normally look. There is a um, secured spark plug and injector recess that's bolted to the cylinder head. That has been removed on this engine for whatever reason. Probably when they swapped it over to the other engine, uh, they needed those parts. So, literally, these injectors are just sitting in here. Don't need a pull or anything to get these out because they're technically not really installed. And then we'll just go ahead and yank this entire assembly out. So there's all the injectors on the fuel rail and then all the feed lines for the injectors. Normally, if you were removing the valve cover, you'd have to remove this entire um, rail. So you'd disconnect it here, you'd disconnect all these feed lines, and you'd just basically be able to pull the valve cover off from that point. 
We're gonna use an E10 socket and release the valve cover. Most of them are missing. So this is actually gonna be really easy. Obviously you'd have these screws normally that hold everything together, but with a core like this, you know, a lot of the disassembly work has been done for you in advance. I'm gonna go ahead and just get the oil filter housing out of the way. Like I said, it's held in place with a bolt that's not the correct one. Normally it's held in with three bolts. And as you can see, there's a lot of oil film on this filter housing. Common source of leaks, we've talked about that in a lot of DIY videos. You can actually see evidence that oil had been leaking at some point with the amount of debris here that's on the front of the, front of the engine. So very common source of oil leaks, often neglected, often missed. And uh, we talked about that ad hoc on the N52, N54, N55, N20s. Um, very important that if you do have an oil filter housing leak, take care of it as soon as possible. Don't let it become a huge problem. Uh, just because of the design of the engine, it'll cause the serpentine belt to swell because uh, oil will fizzle in on it. Once the belt swells, the tensioner can't deal with it anymore. The belt has nowhere to go, but backwards between the harmonic balancer and the front main seal. And then uh, it gets ground up and just pushed in through the front main seal. And then you have a huge problem on your hands from that point forward. So never neglect it. Take care of it immediately as soon as you know they have that problem. So a couple things to mention, uh, clearly the Vano sprockets uh, are missing from the camshafts. It's a core engine, so that's not totally unexpected. Timing chain is still in there. Um, but before we can ever pull the cylinder head off, we do need to remove things like our Vano solenoids right here. And if you wanted to verify a catastrophic engine failure, uh, you can sometimes uh, see evidence of that on the Vano solenoids themselves. So just held in with 10 millimeter screws. I think actually what's really cool here is um, we'll go into depth at some later date to talk about how all of this works, but it's all oil supplied from the oil pump to the top of the cylinder head. The Vano solenoids control oil flow. You can see right here, there's a channel that moves up this way. So oil flow would move into the Vano sprocket. That would force the Vano sprocket to either advance or once that oil is cut off, it'll retard. Same thing happens over here on the exhaust side. So you can actually see those channels. So your top, Vano solenoid is for the intake. The bottom solenoid is for the exhaust side. So all this is oil controlled flow and also these solenoids are pulse width modulated. So, you know, they can basically allow oil flow almost infinitely uh, to these housings right here. Again, oil comes in through these holes and everything moves that way. So um, that's how BMW's done it for a long time. Uh, but this is, was the latest generation of Vanos when this engine came out. So, We'll go ahead and pull the solenoid out, try not to break it. So this is our intake solenoid. And you can see all the screens here. This prevents debris from getting into the feed. And you can actually see inside, uh, it might be hard to see, but there's a little hole right there. That's where oil comes up from the bottom of the engine. I'll shine a light on that. So you can see that little tiny hole there. That is the feed for the intake side from the oil pump. So this all comes up through the engine block into the cylinder head. And the solenoid is what controls flow, again, to the Vano sprocket. Um, there's actually not a lot of debris uh, in the screen. So even though that this engine is locked up tight, it must not have run long enough to send bearing material to the top of the cylinder head. Uh, so these, this is clean, and I imagine the exhaust solenoid will be the same. And that one is clean as well. So the N55 engine had the latest version of Valtronic when it came out. Unlike the N52 engine or the N53 that was in Europe that had a separate Valtronic actuator and sensor, uh, on the N55 it's all integrated in one unit. So the connector that plugs into the top of the valve cover, this is both the position sensor and the drive motor for the eccentric shaft, which is right here. And this eccentric shaft changes the motion ratio of the rockers, which will change valve lift. So this engine has variable valve lift on the intake side. So what makes it unique, or any Valtronic engine unique, is the valve lift is what controls engine speed, not the throttle body. 
So when Valvetronic is functioning, the throttle body is all the way open, and the variable position of this rocker shaft, which changes the uh, motion ratio of the uh, lifters or the rocker arms, is what basically changes the lift. So uh, kind of unique. Uh, this is something that BMW has actually done for a very long time. Valvetronic is actually now used on every single engine, uh, but this was the latest and greatest, much more simplified system than some of the earlier Valvetronic engines where a lot of the components were separate from one another. So before we can get to removing the cylinder head, we need to remove the turbo as well. Um, turbo is both of the cylinder heads so that can make removal of the cylinder head a little bit more awkward. Uh, we still have some of the coolant lines and some of the oil lines still connected, so we want to remove those and then we can remove the turbo exhaust manifold. Uh, as you can see, it's all one piece, the manifold, the turbo, it's all one assembly. It's a single turbo engine, it's a twin scroll turbo actually. Um, so we'll show you a little bit more about that. In the case of this turbo, it spins free and there's no notable shaft play, so technically it might still be okay, aside from the wastegate rattle, uh, which is a common issue in a lot of turbos when they age. Um, so yeah, we're gonna go ahead and get our T30s and we'll go ahead and start removing uh, some of these fasteners here. This should be the oil return or drain. Again, it's held on with the T30 screw. It's probably sealed with an O-ring, if I recall correctly. <sighs> Hold on a second, I'll get a screwdriver for that. Here's our oil feed line. So that's oil to the turbo. Coolant feed. And then this would be the uh, coolant return, which normally connects to a pipe that runs through here. This is actually the coolant feed to the engine block from the water pump. Obviously missing. I'm gonna go ahead and get the engine bracket out of the way as well. Goes without saying that you would never have access to this bolt in the car. The engine mount would be completely in the way. So kind of annoying design from that perspective. Weird, no dowel. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove our turbo here, 11 millimeter. These are copper nuts from the factory, so it's unlikely they would ever get stuck, but not heard for the uh, stud to come out with the nut. There it goes. <laughs> this gas was all bent and tweaked and it was holding the turbo in. So here's a turbo. Go ahead and put that over here. It's actually got some weight to it. Uh, so clearly, uh, like I said earlier, this is missing the Vanos gears and the timing chain is already drooped down there. Uh, so there's actually not much for us to have to remove from the top of the cylinder head to remove the cylinder head entirely. At this point, it's just T50 and T60 sockets. Uh, there's a special head bolt set or head bolt socket set. They look like this. Very long, half inch drive. Uh, clearly, if you don't have these, just to be a little bit more difficult to get access to these bolts. And for whatever reason, um, this engine is missing two of the front head bolts. I don't know why. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start from the outside and work our way in. So uh, what I had to do here is rotate the eccentric cam into the maximum lock, maximum retarded position. Here's a stop right there. Reason being is it was kind of in the way and I was having a hard time getting access to this head bolt back here. I'm also gonna have to remove the eccentric shaft stop here to get access to that head bolt down there. So if you're dealing with that, uh, you can go ahead and just use a four millimeter Allen down through the top. And you can actually manually rotate the eccentric shaft. Super simple. It's just a worm drive gear. So if you're ever having that problem, uh, you can go ahead and remove it that way. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the uh, stop limit for the eccentric shaft, it's just a 10 millimeter. I'll reinstall that after, but that was just preventing me from getting the uh, head bolt socket down in there. And again, that's just the stop limit for the eccentric shaft. And now, without impeded access, we go ahead and loosen that bolt.
And it goes without saying that when you're removing head bolts, you want to do it in an alternating pattern. So before I pull the head, I need to pull the timing chain and the um, timing guides, only because as I pull the head up, uh, these two guides are going to get pinched and I don't want them to break coming out. 22 millimeter socket. I'm going to hope the big old impact gun will uh, loosen it for us. Oh yeah. Woo. So one thing that's unique about uh, all the N series six cylinder engines and also the N20, N26 four cylinder, nothing is keyed. The crank isn't keyed. The camshafts aren't keyed. The only thing that holds timing is the central bolt here and then the cam sprocket bolts that hold the Vano sprockets. Uh, so basically the uh, crank needs to be set at top dead center. The uh, camshafts need to be locked at top dead center. And uh, basically you drop the entire timing cartridge down with the timing chain through the top of the engine. And that's how the engine gets timed. So kind of simple, uh, but when you hear about like S55 engines, for example, spinning a crank hub, it's because the tension was lost on this bolt somehow. These little bolts here, just um, they hold the timing guides uh, in place. Just gonna pull them. And everything fell down. <laughs> but this is the crank snout. So that physically bolts to the front of the crank and it holds uh, your oil pump sprocket and the timing chain sprocket to the crankshaft. Uh, we'll show you a little bit more once we get everything pulled apart. That's one of the pins for the guide. And we go ahead and just pull our timing cartridges up and out. This is literally the, the plastic guide assembly. Uh, normally the timing chain tensioner, which is over here, uh, this would actually push against this, which tensions the uh, entire timing chain assembly. There's our chain with the timing sprocket. And the way that that kind of goes together is this comes in through the front. It's like kind of a intolerance fit. And then the oil pump sprocket will be behind here. And then that all gets bolted together. And the compression from that bolt is what holds all this together. It's kind of a sketchy design from the respect that, again, if that bolt loses tension, you could see that this hub will spin. AKA it's still spinning because of the crank, but the sprocket on the timing chain is no longer spinning. And that's how you spin your, uh, that's how you end up having a uh, valve to piston contact. Now we're gonna go ahead and pull the cylinder head. Oh God, yeah, that's not heavy at all. Jesus Christ. I'm gonna go ahead and just pull the head gasket. As you can see, this is an open deck design. So the cooling jackets are open. Uh, this is one of the power limiting factors of this engine is the fact that um, it's just that wall reinforcing the cylinder walls. So that and the DMA and the fact that uh, the B58 came along and the N54 was around. That's why nobody really focused on these. All right, here comes the time. Uh, where you just expect to get absolutely doused with stuff falling out of the engine. So we're gonna go ahead and rotate it over. Okay, dust. Dust is the only thing that has dripped out so far. Okay, a little, little dribble. We're gonna go ahead and let that sit there for a minute. <laughs> Drippity drip. Actually, you know what we can do? We do it like this. That is, the, that is the most empty I've ever seen an engine in my life. All right, so this was an X drive car. I could tell by the shape of the oil pan. Uh, obviously, there's a hole right in the middle of it. Uh, this would be where the differential or the front differential is bolted. The axle shaft will go through there from the right side. And then you have the stand on the other side or the axle support. Uh, being a core, being that this thing was looked at and there's only a handful of bolts in the oil pan, uh, we're gonna go ahead and go with spun rod bearing. 
I'm gonna yank the oil pan off. Very easy since there's nothing in it. And there's the inside of the engine. So right here is our oil pump. This is the windage tray slash oil pump pickup. Nothing is holding it in, it's been unbolted. So we'll just go ahead and pull that out. And we got a rod cap with no bolts in it. That's the number five. Normally you have to remove the bolts to remove this, but There we go. Solve, solves that question, what happened. That's welded to the, it's literally welded in place. So that got hot. We'll look at that a little bit later. It's not really the preferred method for doing this, but it's just, just kind of junk, so. Oh man, it had a lot of oil on it. N55s have a floating rod. I've heard some complaints about these engines making noise. And that's what you hear is basically the rod moving back and forth on the wrist pin. So it's a floating wrist pin rather. But, so obviously the uh, other bearing is, uh, it's floating, it's actually moving, but it's kind of, we're gonna have to probably bend that to take it off. But you know, when they talk about a spun bearing, I mean, this is kind of what you get. Uh, this thing got very hot and there's also some discoloration here on the cap itself. There's a lot of heat that happened on that journal. We'll see what the rest of the pistons look like and the rest of the connecting rods. See if this was across the engine or if it was just happening in one place. Just to speed up the process here, I'm gonna go ahead and remove the uh, oil pump as it breaks the guide. That actually makes that easy. We're gonna go ahead and pull the oil pump out of here. It's gonna need to be out of here. It's convenient. Oil pump be gone. I'm gonna go ahead and punch a hole in these caps and then we'll pop them out. Uh, these will give us access to additional fasteners that we need in order to remove the rest of the drive mechanism for the oil pump and the vacuum pump. All right, let's see our chain tensioner. Oil pump tensioner has just sort of yeeted itself apart. So this is gonna be interesting. This is the oil pump tensioner assembly. Uh, the oil pump chain also drives the vacuum pump on these engines. Go ahead and remove the uh, gear here for our vacuum pump. Just checking to see if it's uh, left-hand thread or right-hand thread. Appears to be right-hand thread. Um, I'm gonna use this pry bar to hopefully lock it so that the bolt can break free. And that's how you go about replacing a vacuum pump on any of these engines. You have to literally remove all that stuff in the front to retime the engine. So it's good things these are relatively robust, otherwise that would be a really painful process. That was a common job. We've seen signs of every single journal on this engine having some kind of heat problem. So this was a major disruption of oil flow, which could be from a lot of different things. Most obvious one would be a failing oil pump. A least obvious one would be uh, not priming the engine after a major repair. A lot of scoring there. So there was clearly an oil starvation problem on the number three. So that's our number three. I'm gonna suspect the same situation here on number four, because I'm seeing signs of heat as well. So this cap is uh, kind of stuck to the crank journal. So we'll see what's going on there. Probably nothing good. So number four, even though the bearing didn't spin, you could see that the tang, which locates it into that, uh, into the uh, connecting rod cap was starting to wear down. So that would have probably come very close to spinning when this event happened. And uh, 
yeah, it doesn't actually even fit in the connecting rod cap anymore. It just sits in there. So it's very deformed. All the pistons are out. I mean, the crank moves over nicely and everything. And so our next step in this process is we're gonna physically remove the bed plate from the engine block. Uh, one thing to note, there are no crank caps on this engine. It's all from this lower portion of the bed plate on the engine. The way that these are sealed from the factory and the way that you would wanna seal this if you were rebuilding one of these engines at home, there's two injection ports. There's one here over here. Where is it? There's an injection port there and there's an injection port over here. And you would physically inject sealant into the two halves after it's been torqued. And that would fill the void in between the bed plate and the top part of the engine block and that seals it off. So if you ever wonder what those injection ports are for, that's what it's for. There's a special tool from BMW to inject it. I've seen some people try to do RTV on that. Honestly, I don't recommend that. I would use the special tool in order to inject the sealant properly. So next up, we're gonna go ahead and remove the engine bed plate in order to get the crankshaft out. We have 17 millimeter bolts. We're gonna start from the inner portion and work our way out. So that's what I was saying, you can see the chambers here, or the lines. That's for how the sealant is injected into the block from the factory. So you can see one of the injection ports actually stayed in the block. All the sealant comes through here and travels out here past the rear main seal in the rear. So if you ever wonder how that's how they seal the bed plate from the factory, that's how it's done. The lower mains, you can see them right there. A lot of scoring on them. I can actually feel a lot of that. So clearly an oil starve situation. We already kind of addressed that, but it was across the entire engine. All right, we're gonna go ahead and pull the crank out now. Should come up and out. Although we have the rear main seal in the back and the engine that might interfere. So I'm gonna get the reluctor ring out of the way. This is the magnet for the rear crank. There's a TSB about this. When you pull these off the engine, put them inside of a plastic bag so they can't attract, you know, magnetic particles. Would be pretty bad if you put this back together. And there was stuff on that ring. Probably be the easiest rear main seal removal you ever have. So you can see there's a lot of scoring on the number five, number five and number four crank journal. You could see all how dark that is. And if you're ever wondering, the safest way to store a crank for a long period of time is like that. It won't bend. You don't want to sit on the side. You want to sit it up like that. Looking at our uppers here. Uppers don't actually look that bad, but These are supposed to be coated from the factory and I don't see any evidence of that coating anymore. So it's probably been wiped away. And then from here, you obviously have your oil squirters for the bottom of the pistons. We're not gonna remove those. There's no point in doing that. Uh, but these are oil cooled pistons and that's basically the entire engine. So as you can see, major oil starve situation. So it's pretty evident based on the condition of the connecting rod bearings and some of the main bearings that there was a serious oil problem uh, on this engine. Uh, whether that was because of a bad oil pump, not enough oil on the engine, uh, we'll never know. Another thing that we've seen on a lot of N55s now, um, it's kind of untalked about. There is no service bulletin for it, but there is a service bulletin from BMW that talks about priming the engine after a major repair. So vano sprocket repairs, uh, oil filter housing gasket replacements, uh, oil pan gas replacements, oil pump replacements, pretty much anything other than an oil change that involves opening up the lubrication circuit. Uh, BMW says to prime the engine three times for 10 seconds. And uh, it's from my understanding that actually comes from N55s seizing up in the shop after those repairs. And the reason that that could potentially happen on this engine is BMW uh, simplified the oiling circuit by removing a lot of passages. So through that simplification process to make the Vano system more reliable, uh, it is possible for air to get trapped in the circuit. Um, so that will cause an interruption of oil flow through the engine. And if it's running, 
obviously it's gonna dry out very quick. Uh, whatever oil film is between the bearing and the uh, main or crank journals, um, that's only gonna last for so long if there's no additional oil coming through. So uh, one thing that I can definitely say for sure is if you have an N55 and you're doing any type of repair like that, disconnect the injectors, even pull the spark plugs, crank it three times for 10 seconds. Uh, that way you can prime the entire oiling circuit and that should hopefully prevent any kind of problem from happening like this from that repair. But it is known, it is documented, it does happen. Um, so don't know if that was the situation here, uh, but just wanna let you know that there's a service bulletin from BMW pertaining to all engines, but it did stem from the N55 having these problems in the dealer environment. Uh, we do have a lot of repair content on the N55 engine. Uh, that's an ever increasing thing as these engines become older. Uh, we're gonna touch base on pretty much all of that. But anyway, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment box below. If you like this video, hit that like button and hit subscribe. We have a lot more videos on the way. And as always, we'll see you for the next one. Thanks for watching.